The reading this evening is Daniel chapter 3, which can be found on page 886 in the Church Bibles. It's the image of gold and the fiery furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, tre treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O oh, king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, he does not, I beg your pardon, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, 
Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the God Most High, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisers crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was there a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Good evening. Shall we pray? Father God, this is for many of us a familiar story, but we do pray that you will speak to us through it and give us ears to hear what you are saying and hearts to love and obey you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were here last week, um, you would have had the account of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In the dream, he had a picture of a huge statue. Now, Daniel was able not only to interpret that dream, but to tell the king what it was. It was quite amazing. In the dream, with the, um, this huge statue, the head, apparently, which was made of gold, represented Nebuchadnezzar himself. And Daniel had explained very clearly to Nebuchadnezzar that it was God and God alone who had given the king his power, his authority, and his extensive kingdom. But it seems that King Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten all this. So he decided to erect a monstrous statue and force all his subjects to worship it. Possibly this was um, in an effort to unify all the different nationalities and languages and tribes and clans under his rule. The statue was of gold, possibly gold-plated because it was massive. It was 90 feet high and nine feet wide. Um, in new money, that's 27 meters high and 2.7 meters wide. So whatever the um, measurements you like, it was massive. The gold probably came from Jerusalem, from the temple, because the king, Nebuchadnezzar, had ransacked it. Now it's unclear which Babylonian god this statue represented, but it is unlikely that it was an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself. On the day of its dedication, all the officials in the kingdom were summoned to appear. A herald made a solemn declaration. When the musicians begin to play, and I'm not going to list all those, thank you, Pam. When the musicians begin to play, you are to fall down on your face on the ground and worship 
the statue. Anyone who doesn't will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Naturally, everybody did, except three men, the Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends. Now this blatant disobedience was spotted by some of Nebuchadnezzar's astrologers. Now they were probably very jealous of the Jews because these Jews had been promoted to important positions in the country. So they didn't waste any time and went and reported these three men to the king. As you can imagine, Nebuchadnezzar was furious and he summoned the three friends to come and stand before him. Surely this couldn't be true after his special favor towards them and of course the terrible penalty for disobedience. So he magnanimously gave them the opportunity to prove their loyalty and obey his command to fall down and worship the image. If you don't, he said, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then he added, and what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Without hesitation, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied very courteously, but very firmly. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter, your majesty. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the statue. That was extremely brave. Remember, the king had absolute power. What he said was done. But it seems the three friends were totally confident in God's ability to save them. But even if he didn't, they would never deny him. So you can imagine King Nebuchadnezzar's reaction. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual. Seven in the Bible usually means the most. He commanded his soldiers to bind the three friends and throw them in the furnace. The furnace was so hot that the poor soldiers were instantly burnt to death by the flames as they did so. Then something <coughs> extraordinary happened. Nebuchadnezzar was absolutely stunned. He saw not three, but four men, and they were just walking around in the fire, unbound, <coughs> unharmed. One commentator put it like, well, it was just like a walk in the park for them. No problem. The fourth one, the king said, looked like a son of the gods. So who was that fourth person? Was it an angel? Or was this a pre-incarnational appearance of Jesus? Sadly, commentators don't agree. I think it was Jesus. How awesome, though, for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They firmly trusted in their God, but they had no idea whether he would act. They thought he would, and wow, he did. And it must have been absolutely amazing. But Nebuchadnezzar had to admit defeat. There was indeed a God who could rescue the men from his power. So he praised their God, and he honoured Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego for their trust in their God and for being willing to die rather than obey the king and worship other gods. 
He promoted them. And then he ordered the protection of all the Jews and their religion on pain of death. So you see their courageous stand had very far-reaching effects. Now you would have thought that after witnessing God act in such an amazing way that Nebuchadnezzar would have renounced his idols and the statue and turned to the true God in faith and commitment. But no, it took something more, something pretty terrible. But you'll need to come back next week to find out what that was. So we've seen then from this account how what we do and what we say as believers can really bring glory to God and fulfill his purposes in ways beyond our imagining. And what we say and do can be a blessing, not just to ourselves, but far more widely. Are we prepared to stand up and be counted? Or do we tend to keep quiet, fearful of what people might say or do? Our theme this evening is faithful friends. So f firstly, the courageous, consistent, and persevering faithfulness to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You may remember they had been deported to Babylon as teenagers. Their captors had tried to destroy their identity and their culture and their religion by totally immersing them in Babylonian culture, even giving them those Babylonian names. But we saw their faithfulness to God in chapter 1. And they had obviously continued to maintain their relationship with him since that time, so much so that they were ready to die, ready to die a horrible death rather than denounce him. That's quite a challenge to us, isn't it? Do we love our God and our Saviour that much too? But then have we grasped how much God loves us? Probably the most we will suffer for being known as Christians is loss of friends, rejection maybe, ridicule. I'm sure we are well aware that in some countries it will cost a great deal more. We've just heard a little bit about Pakistan. It might mean losing family, employment, <coughs> citizenship and even facing death if you name Jesus as Saviour and Lord. But Jesus has called each one of us to share our faith so that others can come to know him too. I am immensely thankful to my brother, eternally grateful actually, that he told me about Jesus. That's why I'm able to stand here today as a Christian, because he shared his faith with me. Who will be grateful to me and to you when we share our faith with them? Who will we tell about Jesus? We have got a sort of soft option, if you like, by bringing our non-Christian friends to the Ten Commandments. That's not very difficult, is it? But come on, church. It's not so hard, is it? And don't forget, when Jesus called us to be his witnesses, he gave us his Holy Spirit. We are not alone. He gives us the words, the courage, the faith, everything. We just need to step out in faith and obedience. Not only were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faithful to God, they were also faithful friends to one another. They had obviously kept up their friendship and no doubt had continued to encourage one another in their faith. And when trouble came, they stuck together. We really do need one another as Christians. 
we need close Christian friends who will support us and share our joys and our troubles. Friends with whom we can be really honest, be ourselves. Friends with whom we can admit we don't always get it right, admit our failings and our needs and know that in spite of who we are and what we are, they'll stick with us and they will pray for us and with us. I've got a prayer partner like that and it's such a joy to both of us, such an encouragement, such a strength. And also I have my house group friends. I know I can contact them at any time. And if I share my tricky situation, I know that they are going to pray. And we have seen some amazing answer to prayers because it's not just me. We all feel able to share in that close-knit group with one another what's going on in our lives. Such a blessing. This is so important. Think back that even Jesus, our example, had close friends. He had Peter, James, and John. Remember how he just took those three with him when he went to pray with the dead daughter of Jairus? He just took those three up the mountain at the transfiguration to see his glory. And then he took those three with him, his special friends, to watch with him, to pray with him, to support him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he faced the crucifixion. But they fell asleep, so like us. So, may I ask you, do you have a prayer partner? Do you have a small group of Christian friends to support you, to pray with you and for you, and to journey with you on the path of faith? If you do, that's great. But do guard that relationship. Do make it a priority. And do be a faithful friend in return. And if you don't yet, could you please make it a priority? Please ask the Lord who you could establish that sort of relationship with. It is so important and it will make a great difference to you in your Christian life. Could I say to our three youngsters off to university, look for Christian friends because there will be so many temptations. You need one another to support you, to help you, to pray with you. So two important challenges for us this evening. To be faithful to God and to be a faithful Christian friend. Going back to Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Think what God achieved through them, through their faithfulness. What could he achieve through us? if we too are faithful. I believe the possibilities are very exciting.